Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Feast of Trumpets. Have you ever had a product that quit working almost immediately after the warranty expired? That's happened to me a few times, and, and so I'm told that sometimes things are even engineered for that to happen or are close to it. Some call it planned obsolescence, a description of products that seemingly by design fall or fail within a few years and, and sometimes even a few months after the warranty expires. Unfortunately, practically the whole of professed Christian Christianity is under the impression that God uses planned obsolescence when it comes to his plan for mankind, the entirety of God's purpose and plan. Millions believe that Christ's sacrifice did away with God's law, which was nailed to the cross, of course, as, uh, as we know. The entirety of the Old Testament, for example, they assume is obsolete. Its only value is history, if you're interested in the history of the people of Israel. The Sabbath is obsolete uh, as well. It's been replaced by so-called the Day of the Sun or the Sunday. The biblical holy days, the holy days of God, are obsolete. God changed his mind at some point in his plan. Jesus Christ replaced them with Easter, replaced them with Christmas. So the entirety of God's plan for mankind consists of Christmas and Easter, the two main holy days. Christ was born, he died, and he was resurrected. No wonder the professed Christian world is confused. They don't know that coming out of sin, we see that in unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, coming out of sin is defined by the law of God. That's how we know how to come out of sin and change our life. They don't know about the time schedule of the early harvest, which reflects in first fruits and Pentecost, and the lateral and the later spiritual harvest that is, that is in the fall of the year, as outlined by the fall holy days. They don't know about Christ's return to set up his government, replacing Satan, setting up his government literally on the planet. And they don't know about the millennium and the great white throne judgment. We know that all eventually will have an opportunity. All of humanity that have ever lived will have an equal opportunity to know the true God. Uh, it's, not de it's not defined by fate or having to be born at the right time or the wrong time in history or the wrong location or the right location. All of humanity at some point in time with future resurrections will have an opportunity to at least come to know the true God and decide whether or not they will follow, they will commit their way to the family of God and to his way. Today we are here to keep the Feast of Trumpets, which the world has considered planned obsolescence, that is scripturally. We know it's not a dusty, outdated relic of the past, of the Old Testament, but in fact this day reveals the future to us. It reveals the future aspects of God's plan. It is the roadmap to the kingdom. And that's the title of the sermon, the roadmap to the kingdom. Today we're going to look at the origin of the Feast of Trumpets. Then we're going to look at this roadmap of God's, to God's kingdom in the years ahead of us. Let's start out by turning to Exodus chapter 31, and we'll get a little bit of an overview here leading up to the day of trumpets and what it means, and we'll look more closely at its application to us. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbaths, notice it's plural here. It's my Sabbath, not just my Sabbath. My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign. It's an indicator between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord. In other words, that I am the eternal. You may know who the true God is who sanctifies you. So keeping the weekly and the annual Sabbaths that is, the Holy Day convocations are a sign. It's like hanging a sign around your neck. It's like saying, we belong to God. It's advertising that we belong to God and we know it. You may remember during World War II that Nazi Germany, yeah, within that 
realm of the world during that period of time. Some of the Jews were required to wear a Star of David, even as an identifying sign to identify them as Jews. And in, in that case, it was a negative sign. It was intended to be a negative sign, a sign of derision. The purpose of God, of God's sign, found in verse 13. Why do we need a sign? It mentioned in verse 13, last part of the verse, that you may know that I am the Lord, that I am the Eternal who sanctifies you. So keeping the sign identifies us as God's people and also identifies to us who the true God is. It's, it's a pointer. It relates to who the true God is that you may know that I am the eternal. In other words, I am the ever-living one. I am the true God of the universe. If we weren't keeping the weekly and the annual Sabbaths, as we see as that sign, we would no longer in time know the true God. We would drift off and lose knowledge and lose sight of who the true God is. Is the true God the God of the Sabbath? Is the true God the God of, let's say, the day of the sun or Sunday? Is the true God the, the day, the God of, well, the Mass of Christ or Easter, named after the pagan goddess Ishtar? Or is the true God the God of the seven annual holy days that outline the entirety of God's plan? If we were to keep Satan's false day of worship, that is the day of the sun, or if we kept the world's annual holy days, as I mentioned, such as Christmas and Easter and others, this also would be an identifying sign as well. It would identify us as part of that great deception that we read about in Revelation chapter 18. We know the whole world has been deceived according to God's word. So let's turn to the specific sign then, the annual Sabbath. It gives us much of the road map to the end of the age of Christ's return, ushering in the kingdom of God. It will outline that road map. Leviticus chapter 23. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 23. Leviticus 23, 23. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month. Uh, this is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. On the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So we see the seventh month, there will be a Sabbath rest. God considers it this Sabbath then, uh, this special occasion as a Sabbath, as an annual Sabbath that occurs just once a year. One of the identifying signs of God's people. It helps us to identify who the true God is is and what he teaches. It mentions then a memorial, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets. What is a memorial? Well, of course, the blowing of trumpets for physical Israel, it's a reminder on an annual occasion. It had specific meaning in the past, and we might ask, well, what is that meaning? What, what is it a memorial of? What does it remind? Did it remind ancient Israel of? Of course, keep in mind, physical Israel did not have the book of Revelation as we do today, as the church has today, as spiritual Israel, as we understand it has today. Yet it is yet to occur in the immediate years ahead, and we will see, of course, uh, the book of Revelation unfold in prophecy. And of course, physical Israel did not have the book of, Israel, of Revelation in those years. Back to Numbers, let's go to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10 and verse 1. We'll read about some of the trumpets. Two different kinds of trumpets, a blowing of trumpets. Numbers 10 and verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets. Now this is one of the types of trumpets. Two silver trumpets for yourself. And you shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for the calling of the congregation and for the directing of the movement of the camps. Verse 3, 
And when they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So these were to gather the tribes together for assembly at special occasions. Verse 4. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall gather to you. And when you sound the advance, the advance, the camps that lie on the east side shall then begin their journey. And when you sound the advance on the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall begin the journey, and they shall sound the call for them to begin their journeys. So it was blown, they were blown, to keep them ready to advance, particular times to advance to the promised land. Seven trumpets then, as we think about the trumpets in the book of Revelation, as we think about uh, the meaning of the day of trumpets, the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation will be indicators to God's people who are listening that we're getting close to the promised land. In other words, the timing of God's kingdom, the very kingdom of God. Now verse 9. And when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you in those years, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets, an, an alarm, a warning with the trumpets. And you will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. So here we have the trumpets, uh, an alarm, a sound of war. It was an indicator, of course, sometimes of difficulties, of attacks that were occurring. And we know in the book of Revelation, the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation will overview, as one looks at the seven trumpets, the whole climatic tr struggle at the end of the age, including literally World War III, uh, the forces of evil uh, incite the nations to war, final battle that will occur. We know we think of it as the Battle of Armageddon, the war to end all wars, uh, some 200 million strong as far as an army. The Creator and his armies from heaven at that time will obliterate the very largest war machine that has ever been assembled against some 200 million soldiers assembled in the Middle East. You know, Jewish tradition preserves the fact that besides the silver trumpets made of silver, the metal silver, there was a curved ram's horn or shofar, which was blown on the day of trumpets. A silver trumpet produces a variety, of course, of musical notes, and it can be musical. It's not just a single note. But a shofar, or a ram's horn, produces a piercing blast, more or less a single note, obviously getting one serious attention when you hear that piercing blast. The seven trumpet blasts of the book of Revelation are intended to get serious attention for, from us, from the inhabitants of the world potentially as well. Look at Exodus chapter Exodus chapter. 19 and verse 16. And we'll see the shofar being used, apparently. Exodus 19 and verse 16 from Mount Sinai. Very momentous time when the law of God was delivered. Exodus 19, verse 16. It says, And then it, sh it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp, they trembled. So Mount Sinai uh, was a very, well, piercing blast. The third day there were thunderings and lightnings, and it says the sound of the trumpet was very loud. It was so loud and so piercing that the people trembled, they shook. And that kind of piercing sounds kind of vibrates you, vibrates you to the core. And again, I'm sure this was not a musical note or a series of notes, but the piercing sound of the shofar of, a, of a more to come from the great God. Exodus 19 and verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord, because the great God, the eternal, 
descended upon it in fire. It was evidence of the God showing his power. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Now verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. So the trumpet got louder and louder, kind of a piercing sound, so overwhelmingly loud and piercing that people trembled. You know, with an angel blowing a trumpet, I'm sure that they will have more power it would just make, so to speak, your blood curdle to hear that kind of sound. Have you ever heard such an, an alarming sound? Well, I'm sure none of us have ever heard a sound like that. But years ago, my mother told me about the time our family was on a tour boat uh, up in Canada, and there was a, well, a, a piercing blast from the ship's horn. And I was a little guy, I was a little toddler. And it just happened to scare me so much. It just made me jump, and I was, all of a sudden, I was just crying uncontrollably. It was really loud, and I vaguely, <clears throat> excuse me, I vaguely remember it, but uh, that kind of sound can get your attention. Now let's move on to Exodus 20, verse 18. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, and the lightning flashes, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled, and they stood afar off. So they saw some of the power of the great God, and uh, they wanted to back off a little bit here. Verse 19, Then they said to Moses, You speak with us. In other words, you, not God. It's pretty fearful to stand here before God. And we will hear, Moses, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So the piercing blast of the trumpet was enough. It was, a, it was enough for them at the time. And the shofar became associated with a serious warning. God has a message. God has a message for humanity. In this case, it was the law of God for Israel, and of course, ultimately, the whole earth in time. But the message typically with the shofar on the day of the trumpets was a message of impending warning and alarm. And of course, that was blown at various times in Israel's history. Jeremiah had a reaction, a reaction to the sound of the trumpet, a warning. I think it's helpful to get Jeremiah's reaction so we get a little bit of a feel of what that must have been like. Jeremiah chapter 4, to have maybe stood there in Jeremiah's day and to hear the shofar and what it meant. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 19. So here's Jeremiah's reaction to the shofar, the sound, the piercing sound. Oh, my soul, my soul. In other words, my body, my life. I am pained in my very heart. He, he knew what it meant. He knew what it implied. My heart makes a noise in me. His heart was pumping hard and Kind of felt like it was about ready to jump out of his chest. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, in other words, my consciousness, my, my, my life, my being, you've heard the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Jeremiah was shaken himself. Verse 20, destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is plundered, Suddenly my tents are plundered, and my curtains in a moment. Now verse 21. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? So Jeremiah, on hearing the sound of the shofar, he was so overcome with fear of invasion that it was imminent, that was momentarily about to happen. It, it could be a terrifying thought, you know, just thinking about it, hearing that sound, it triggers a reaction. Back then, even women and children on, with invading armies might be slaughtered. There is no mercy showed. So this was an, an ominous sound, and Jeremiah knew it well. He understood the meaning of it. Even the Israelites used the shofar to induce panic of an impending invasion. They wanted to induce panic in their enemies. Joshua chapter 
look over just briefly in, uh, in Joshua, and we'll look at Joshua chapter 6 and verse 15. <clears throat> Joshua 6 and verse 15. And it mentions in verse 15, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early. Remember, they, they were at the area of Jericho, and uh, it was time for the inhabitants of Jericho to give way. It came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day only, they marched around the city seven times. Let me read that again. Came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And verse 16. And the seventh time it happened when the priests blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So they were, to, they were to make a lot of noise with a trumpet and to shout. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. And then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. So essentially on the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times, and the walls fell down, and the Israelites were given the city. And of course, the parallel happens in the future, at the end of the age, unique parallel, as we know. The seventh angel sounds, and there are seven trumpets uh, at the time of the seventh angel. And this last trumpet has seven divisions, or seven last plagues, that we see in the book of Revelation. When the kingdom of God, when the kingdom of God consumes the kingdoms of the world, when Christ and his saints begin to rule. In this case, it's not Jericho, of course, but it is the entire world. Back to Leviticus chapter 23. And we notice in Leviticus 23 that God called the Feast of Trumpets a memorial. It was a memorial they were supposed to remember, some significance of the warning of the trumpets uh, in their lives, what they had seen. It was a reminder on an annual occasion. And of course, in truth, the Israelites were to observe the holy days, acting out God's plan, God's plan for all of humanity. They didn't really understand the intricacies of the plan of God like we do, like spiritual Israel does. To us, God has given us so much understanding, so much understanding of the plan of God, uh, a real spiritual understanding what these holy days mean, what the entire plan of God, uh, what it means, and how it transpires over a period of time, looking out even into the future. So for 6,000 years, God has allowed mankind, under Satan's rule, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt without a doubt that mankind cannot live together in peace. Mankind does not know the way of peace. They have not known. We find that in Isaiah 59, verse 8. They have also proven that Satan's way of life, his way of competition, his way of only the strong will survive as if we compete at a high enough level. His way of life of extreme competition absolutely does not work it's always ends in failure. It brings destruction to the species, that is, uh, to us human beings at a high level when we compete. Instead of working together in peace and in harmony for a common cause and a common good, well, we know, in fact, Christ stated in Matthew 24 that unless God would intervene at the end of this age, there would be no human flesh alive. We would be competing at such a high level on a national level with warfare, that World War III in time would erase all flesh from the planet. Of course, God is going to intervene as part of the meaning of his plan of the Day of Trumpets, that Jesus Christ intervenes, he returns, 
He establishes his kingdom. He sets up his government on the earth. So this day of trumpets represents the beginning of God's intervention in mankind's affairs. God must intervene in the language, in the only language that humanity generally understands, and that is overwhelming force and power. And God will meet the armies of the world with tremendous force and power. And they'll finally begin to understand, as many scriptures say, so they will know that I am the eternal. In other words, the great God of the universe, the creator, he does exist. He created the vast heavens, the galaxies, intricate human life. So they will know that I am the eternal. So he will speak their language in overwhelming force and power. So God intervenes to save mankind from themselves. The day of the Lord, the, the seven trumpets of the book of Revelations, the day of the Lord occurs because of mankind's sin and rebellion and rejection and revolt to the true God. Isaiah 24, verses 1 and 5 points that out. And also, the day of the Lord occurs because the whole earth needs to know the true God. So they will know that I am the true God. I am the eternal. And we even find in Ezekiel 38, speaks of Gog and Magog uh, at a time they go to war, even against the beginning of God's kingdom. And the outcome of that, when Jesus Christ puts down that rebe rebellion, he says, then they shall know that I am the eternal. In other words, I am the ever-living one. I am the creator of the universe. And we find that in Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 22 and 23. Well, this year I won't take the time to review or overview the seven trumpets of the day of the Lord, as we do sometimes there in the book of Revelation. But I would like to look briefly at the seventh trumpet. That seventh trumpet... And Christ's return, before we look at some of the lessons of the day of the Lord. In other words, how does this day apply to us, this day which is yet future? How does it apply to our lives today, even before it occurs, even before it occurs beginning with the first trumpet in the book of Revelation, the beginning of the day of the Lord, the beginning of the intervention of God? Well, let's look at uh, a brief overview of the seventh trumpet. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and it tells us, it refers to that seventh trumpet, that last trumpet. Verse, chapter 11, verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded, and again we're speaking here, seventh angel blowing the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet. Seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And we find an announcement of the seventh trumpet, and it, it leads to the ushering in of the kingdom of God. Christ returns, gathers the saints, and of course, he soon, in short order, within a short period of time, he establishes his government upon the earth. And, of course, there's 1 Corinthians 15, 51, uh, a well-known scripture that speaks of the last trump, the last trumpet. What occurs at the last trumpet? 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And Paul says to the Corinthians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. In other words, I tell you something that's not well-known or no known at all in the world anyway. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to sleep, in other words, be dead and waiting for the first resurrection. But we shall all be changed, verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Of course, the last trumpet is the seventh. Scripture says there are seven in the book of Revelation, not eight or ten, but seven. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. In other words, we'll have very powerful spirit bodies. We'll no longer be corruptible, or we won't decay, grow old, weary, tired. We'll be incorruptible, and also spiritually 
as well, incorruptible. Those who are raised will be totally committed to God's way of life, to sharing that good news with humanity. Verse 53, for this corruptible, in other words, this flesh, must put on incorruption, a very powerful spirit body, and this mortal must put on immortality. Can you imagine that experience? You look forward to that time of being changed into a very powerful being, the, a son of God, immortal, ever living, ever energized, and awake and alert. One moment, you have the, you have the if you're alive at that time, one moment, same old tired body as you grow older, you're used to, you've lived in that body for however many years. And next instant, you're changed. You're changed. A very powerful body, no glasses like I wear, no creaky joints or no arthritic joints, no warts or moles or imperfections that, I, that uh, we all have. And you look at yourself and you realize you're still you. You recognize yourself, you're still you, you're still the same being, the same consciousness, but you have a new body. You feel a surge of life and of power as a very powerful spirit being, a, a literal son of God. You might say suddenly you realize it's liftoff, if I can use that uh, analogy, as you rise to meet Christ in the air. It's liftoff as a literal son of God, not a make-believe or an angel, but as a literal son of God, as a brother of Christ, literally. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians rather, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Of course, we know that's the last trump from 1 Corinthians 15, we read a moment ago. With the trumpet of God, the last trump, the seventh trump, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They will come be resurrected, back to life, all those who have completed their training over the last 6,000 years, and who died, as Christ said, who, who really slept in the grave, with no consciousness, they just simply waiting, asleep for the resurrection. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain, those of us who have been faithful, we finished our training, we're ready to graduate, so to speak. We're ready to move on to our real career. Shall be caught up together and with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In other words, wherever Christ goes, we're going to be with Christ. We're going to be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we find in sequence, of course, there has to be the marriage of the, of the Lamb. Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. Let's start with verse 1. 19 verse 1. And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot, the great false religious church, the universal church, the body of, of belief that a harlot religion would produce, the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, so with her fornication, with her fornication, with false spirits, with false gods, those who pretend to be God, but yet are rebellious spirit beings, demons. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants and shed by her. And again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders, verse 4, and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine the experience of, of seeing that? Verse 5, then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God 
all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. He reigns on, on the earth. And let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So the wife of Christ, symbolically the church, has made herself ready. Ready, literally, to join Christ in a covenant. Verse 8, in a contract, completed. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So they are arrayed in, in fine white linen, indicating a righteous way of life, a righteous way of thinking, a successful way of thinking, which righteousness is. It's success that leads to real life. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Incredible. What a, what a blessing. What a tremendous blessing. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now verse 10, and I fell at his feet. In other words, apparently John fell at an angel's feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the apostle John was told not to worship angels or other spirit beings, but to worship God. Verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So he judges. He judges the people of the earth, and he makes war. To put down rebellion, open rebellion, the great rebellion, some 200 million people, strong at, well, in the Middle East, at Megiddo, at a point in time. Verse 12, now notice his description. His eyes were like a flame of fire, eh, brilliant. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So he didn't have, at least Christ, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the resurrected Christ, didn't have that false religious appearance as portrayed by so many, kind of long-haired, effeminate, forlorn. But this is the powerful creator, the resurrected Christ, the king of kings, eyes like flames of fire, the image of force and power and authority. Of course, we know also love and mercy at the same time. Verse 14, In the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, we notice up there, in verse 8, that the saints are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So those with him appear as armies rather than, you know, the paisley painted image of saints with, uh, well, with halos and weak smiles. The armies follow, are clothed, it says, in fine linen, Radiant and white, and a very powerful, clean look. Verse 8 mentions, of course, the bride of Christ is arrayed in fine linen. And it says, they follow him on white horses. Well, assuming that these horses are literal spiritual creatures, part of God's creation, and he can create in the spirit world that way too, this will be an awesome sight when you think about it. A powerful white horses. We know Jude 15 tells us that Christ will come with tens of thousands of his saints and with a very great number, in other words. And, and this will be a brilliant, lightning-quick display at the arrival of Christ, the Creator, and his armies that have followed on white horses. It won't be a casual cruise through the skies. It will be a flash. It will be brilliant. It will be powerful. And we read in, in the scripture that, as Christ said, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven 
shines to the other part of heaven, across the skies. So also the Son of Man will be in his day. It will be the same appearance, a flash of lightning and power. Christ stated that in Luke chapter 17, verse 24. So Christ will descend at that time to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. You can find a brief description, Zechariah chapter 14. Exciting scriptures here. The day of the Lord, we think about the, the meaning, the fulfillment of the seventh trumpet in its entirety. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. It says the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, women ravished, half the city will go into captivity. That's earlier. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And now verse 3. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against these nations. So in this interval, Christ, of course, has gathered the saints. There's been the marriage of the Lamb. Christ returns then with the saints. And the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations who are gathered in rebellion and revolt as he fights in the day of battle. Kind of exciting to think about God himself accomplishing this purpose, settling humanity in time, uh, ending their revolt and rebellion. Of course, we will help Christ to settle the people in time, to help them realize that we're here to help, not destroy, but to help, to lead them to a better way of life, of peace, prosperity, the ultimate opportunity to have real life, even eternal life, if they choose. It goes on to say, And in that day his feet will, sound, will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. We see tremendous evidence here of the power that will occur in the earth's crust. And, of course, there will be a splitting of this mountain and a valley occurs. Verse 5, Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Ozel. Yes, you shall flee, as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, notice, the Lord God will come, Christ will come, and all the saints with you. Oh, so the saints will accompany Jesus Christ at that time, at, at that moment, after the marriage supper. They will accompany Jesus Christ at that very moment, and the family of God has been expanded all the saints will be with Jesus Christ. What an incredible, awesome experience and picture, if you can conceive of that. This is the beginning now of the kingdom of God and the rule of Jesus Christ, and you're a part of it. At this moment in time, all the saints are with Jesus Christ. They have come, come from their previous location where the married supper was, as, as we know, as we understand. It's occurred before the God the Father standing on the sea of glass, and they have come with Jesus Christ, the one who becomes Lord of Lords and King of Kings over the entire earth. And you are part of it, and you are there, and you are experiencing that tremendous step in the plan of God. Do we struggle sometimes in our life at the moment? Of course, we live in the present all too often comparatively insignificant our life now it's brief passing period of a few years of vapor compared to the destiny that God intends for us do we sometimes lose the vision of what God has in mind for us and where the seven trumpets will lead and ultimately to our return with Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God Romans chapter 8 I think gives us a uh, just a reminder, a quick reminder of that glory. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Romans 8 verse 16. It says, For the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit 
a human spirit, that we are children of God. If we receive God's spirit, we've been begotten. We're waiting for our birth at, at Christ's return. But for now, we're begotten. We're like an embryo or a fetus within the mother, within the church, not yet born. And if children, so as we are, begotten children, then heirs, meaning we will inherit something, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So we inherit what, whatever Christ has inherited, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So if we suffer through this life at times, and we have challenges, difficulties. This society is not built to support God's way of life. Satan is the God of this world. But if, if we struggle, we suffer a little bit, but we maintain our vision. We maintain our focus on the future, on the coming kingdom of God, on existence as God intended it and meant for us. And we'll have something really to motivate us throughout the remainder of our lives in the next few years. For I consider, verse 18, that the sufferings of this present time, whatever our tests and trials are, whatever you experience, whatever I experience, are not worthy, there's no comparison, to be compared with a glory which shall be revealed in us. And you analyze that, it says the glory revealed in us. Um, yes, there's glory revealed in Jesus Christ, but also a glory revealed in us as powerful sons of God, fully glorified, with powerful spirit bodies, with uh, energy, unending energy. And uh, as we know, with a mind, a spirit mind, no longer slowed down by the human hardware of the brain, uh, being able to think and recall, instant recall. We become so much more effective teachers with that kind of recall, instant recall, glorified, exciting, and we have that destiny to fulfill, to help humanity begin to see. They've got a better future. They've got, there's a reason for the creation of the universe, uh, for the rest of the universe as we know. More scriptures in Romans chapter 8 explains that. But for now, we know that the next step is for us to be fully born into God's family. Well, before we close, I'd like to ask... A quick question, and that is, what lessons from trumpets can we apply to our lives today? We know trumpets, by and large, is future. That is, the return of Christ, uh, the seven trumpets. Uh, we know at the seventh trumpet, Christ returns to gather his bride, and, uh, to gather the saints the, and those who are changed or, or resurrected. But we know there is some meaning in, in that for us today. It's not just future, it is future, but also there should be some meaning for us today. So hopefully we can pick up that message, we can apply it in our life today. Let's look at two questions that we can ask ourselves on this day of trumpets. Number one, I like to think of it this way, are we individually? We know we are collectively, but are we individually helping to blow the trumpet warning? Uh, blow the warning of the trumpet to humanity of what is to come. Ezekiel chapter 33 speaks of one kind of warning that God wants to go out to the world. God wants the warning to go to the entire world, but also the descendants of Israel. And God wants physical Israel to be warned. He wants the entire world to be warned and witnessed to. Ezekiel 33, beginning in verse chapter 2. Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman to be alert, to be watching for danger. And when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, he's saying, if he does what he's supposed to do, and whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, the blood shall be on his own head. So God intends for a watchman, for the watchman, to be warning the world. In verse 5, he heard the sound of the trumpet, 
but did not take warning, his blood will be upon him himself. He'll be without excuse, at least at that level. But he who takes warning will save his life. You know, today the church performs that function, warning the world, or warning the entire world, and witnessing to the entire world, but also the descendants of Israel, who have been, been given tremendous blessings, national blessings. And we warn the descendants of Israel also of the coming destruction of the satanic system. We warn the whole world as well. So it goes on to applying it to the world as well. The upheavals ahead and also beyond that with the seven trumpets of the coming kingdom of God. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, one who is assigned to do that, and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his, in his iniquity, but the, his blood I re require at the watchman's hand. So we, we take God's directive seriously, his commission seriously. We can't say, it's not our job, it's not my job to warn the world, to warn the, the descendants of Israel, but the entire world. Many people with a Church of God background in recent years have done exactly that. They assume it's no longer their job. They've isolated themselves in one way or another, and they state that the warning of the world doesn't apply today. Have you ever seen any of the annual Not My Job Awards? I think they have been on the Internet. I think the classic is a picture, and it was sent to me a few years ago, a picture of a double yellow line, the center of a road, down the middle of a road, and unfortunately, this is, this is two painted yellow lines, and unfortunately, a double yellow line is painted right over the top of a dead possum. There's yellow stripes right over a dead possum. And the, the highway line painter apparently determined that it's not my job to move the possum. So when it comes to the work of God, can we use the, it's not my job excuse? You know, it's up to somebody else, it's not my job. Is that going to impress God? If we understand God's message, I don't think so. It's not going to impress God at all. Verse 7. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me, for me. And verse 8. And when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. That's the outcome of a living contrary to the, law, the spiritual laws of God. It, it is death. It leads to death. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So God intends for us to be a watchman, in a way, warning and witnessing to the world to turn from the rebellion, the rejection of the great God, the true God, the creator of the universe. And God has that warning for us to do. Verse 11, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And then God says in a, in a plea, Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? And of course, God doesn't want the world at large either to suffer. God wants the whole world to be warned, at least to be witnessed to, so they can never say, well, you know, God, you, you hadn't told us. We would have got things together. We would have got together in the UN. If you would have at least told us that you existed or were going to intervene, we would have cooperated. Well, you can feel, I think, in the, this verse here, God's deep concern for humanity, the real deep significance of the warning message of trumpets. As Scripture so often says concerning the seven trumpets, the day of the Lord, so they will know that I am 
the eternal, the ever-living one, the supreme God. We didn't evolve from slime mold. There is a creator. Evolution is a false religion with a dogma of beliefs that is, well, and realistically, dogma of beliefs that are not even logical. You have to accept them by faith. There's no proof, no evidence. That's part of the religion of Satan as well. So the Feast of Trumpets reminds us of this very era of God's work today when a remnant of the Philadelphia era is to function as a watchman sounding the trumpet warning. So we have to ask ourselves, are we individually? Is that our heart? Is that our, our desire, our wants to blow this trumpet? Is that what we have our focus as, as individuals? We know collectively we must, but individually. Helping God's church complete the work in every way that we can. Is that a reality? Or are we just going along for the ride? Is it the focus then of our heart, our very being, our, our meaning for living and breathing? You know, our heart can be. It is reflected in our prayers. How we speak to God, what we talk about to God. Now, of course, we can learn from our prayers where our priorities are. God learns about us as well, where our priorities are. And are we focused? Are we praying about this effort? Are we helping to blow the trumpet? Of course, we help support that effort as well, and blowing the trumpet with our tithes and our offerings. That's really where, the, in a sense, the rubber meets the road. It takes an effort, a collective effort. We're part individually, we're part of that effort. We need to support it working together in harmony, praying about the work of God, and supporting with our financial resources as best we can with all our heart. And finally, number two, are we personally taking the trumpet's warning seriously in our own lives? Are we hearing the trumpet warning? Is preparing for the kingdom of God and developing godly character the high priority the very highest priority in our life? Or are we paying, as some would say, maybe a little bit of lip service to it? And we like the idea, but we've got another life to live. Of course, we know this life is so very short, we've got very little time to finish our training. Are we filled with appreciation that God the Father, the all-powerful God of the universe, has chosen us personally? to take on his family name, to be trained, to be firstborn children of the great God, where we'll actually rule with love and mercy, to train the people of the earth, and later, as God expands his family through the universe to do God's purpose as he finishes the creation? Or does it still seem like a nice-sounding, let's say, Bible story, something maybe we grew up with, maybe we didn't? We've heard it for years. We like the sound of it. But life in the present is so much more real to us. Is that the case? If we do apply the trumpet warning seriously in our lives, we'll get busy. We'll get busy preparing ourselves now. It's not tomorrow. It has to be now. This is the time of our training. And God will spare us from the destruction to come when the, the whole system, the satanic system, is destroyed. It's removed. So, to take the trumpet warning seriously, we're going to have to, in our own lives, we're going to have to listen. We're going to have to hear the trumpet. You think about that. If you're driving a car, and if you were wearing earbuds, let's say, plugged into an iPod or something similar, and you're listening to loud music as you drive down the road, and an ambulance or a fire truck comes from the side or up behind, barreling towards you at high speed, you might not hear the siren warning if you're not listening, if you're not hearing, and you could easily end up in a major traumatic crash. So God gives us plenty of warning. We've got to hear, we've got to tune in, if we tune into that very warning. Let's turn to the book of Revelation, the very book that contains the seven trumpets and the seven last plagues of the seventh trumpet. And... We turn to Revelation chapter 3, speaking to us, the remnant, hopefully, individually, and we have a true Philadelphian spirit 
at that desire, at genuineness, to change ourselves and the world. Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have heard my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We know the hour of trial that comes upon the whole world. We know that's the end of the age, the tribulation, the day of the Lord. Of course, the day of the Lord being the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation as overviewed. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast. What you have that no one may take your crown, so hang in there, stay true. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, a major supportive aspect of the family of God. And he shall go out no more, never to leave God's family. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, and the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Now notice verse 13 for us today. He who has an ear, he who hears this message and understands, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, take warning, tune in to Christ's warning. Christ also says the majority at the end of the age, where the dominant spirit is kind of lukewarm before Christ's return of so many of the people of God. Verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, either way. If you're ice cold, I, I'd just let you go and get around to you later. If you're on fire or hot, you could do my work. But if you're not, if you're in the middle, you're not of a whole lot of value. It's kind of like one foot in the world and one foot in, in the church. I know your works. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you or spew you out of my mouth. So Christ says, I can't use you in a lukewarm state. You've got to be whole, committed with all your heart. Verse 22. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Once again, he who has an ear. In other words, if you tune in, if we will turn in, we've got a, a very few years left to finish our training. Now we can apply that warning, of course, of the church and the work in Ezekiel 33 in a personal way. Have you ever noticed that when an alarm clock goes off at a certain time, maybe it's 4 a.m., you've got to get up really early for some reason, and when the alarm goes off, if you hear the alarm and if you respond immediately, everything works out okay. You get up, shut the alarm off, you stay up, and you're on your way. On the other hand, if you turn off the alarm, and you pause back in bed, a few minutes, what happens? You go back to sleep, and you really, you don't get up. You really don't manage your appointment that you so badly wanted to make. The whole nature of the alarm, like the trumpets, is to be, a, to be effective. You have to respond immediately. You hear it. It's alarming. You respond. You get up. You respond to God's word. Same thing is true spiritually. When God gives us warning, if we don't respond immediately, when we hear the alarm, when we understand the alarm, we often drift back to sleep eventually. We may even forget that we've heard the warning with understanding. That understanding will leave us in time. And of course, we know that there are so many, there are so many aspects of that warning. We're reminded, of course, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 33, maybe we'll go back there for just a brief moment, Ezekiel 33 and verse 2, 33, 2, and it speaks of the sword. Chapter 33 and verse 2, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from them, from their territory, and make him their watchman. You know, the sword can apply to us spiritually. Through God's church, we learn what sin is. We understand, you know, how we harm ourselves when we violate the spirit of the law. We learn that the rejection to God and to his laws, they lead to a great deal of misery and suffering and heartache and depression. Verse 4, 
And whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, <clears throat> his blood shall be on his own head. If we hear the warning, message of God, if we drift back to sleep, we have no one to blame but ourselves. You know, our blood or misery is upon our own head. And verse 11 Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your way, your evil ways, for why should you die? That applies to physical Israel. That applies to all of us, spiritual Israel. God has no pleasure in seeing any of us suffer, humanity suffer, but especially us, those who have the truth. Applied to physical Israel, but it applies even more to Spiritual Israel to the church. God doesn't want to see us suffer. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to have a better life, more abundant life in the present even, with more stability, not loaded with fear and anxiety and frustration, but love and power. God gives us potentially a sound mind if we want it. So God has offered us a road map to the kingdom of God through the holy days, and this very day, that is the Feast of Trumpets. This day should be a warning to all of God's people. Let's conclude, finally, in Luke 21. We look at that warning. Hopefully we take it to heart. We apply it in our own life. We get with it. We support that warning message to the world. We fulfill our commission. That is part of our training. Luke 21, verse 25. It says, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, and men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Incredible, you know, the powers of the heaven, of nature, is going to be shaken. Verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, you know, and partying, partying, and just having a good time. And it goes on to say drunkenness, even worse, where you, you're escaping from life with addictions and the cares of this life, or really even your own issues and your own concerns in the immediate, overshadows your potential, your future, life in the kingdom of God, in the family of God. It goes on to say that in that day, it's speaking of the day of the Lord. It's speaking of the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. Come on you unexpectedly. In other words, you're not watching. You're not waiting. You're not active. Verse 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always. Another be connected. Be connected to the great God. Be activated. Be alert that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Isn't that what we want, to be able to be able to stand before God, having finished our training, hopefully in peace and safety, as God protects his children who are zealous and kind of, we might say, ready to hit the ground running at Christ's return, to stand before the Son of Man, ready to go. This time of trumpets, the day of the Lord, will be a difficult time for the planet as nations seek to destroy each other. But for us, for the, for the children of God, for the people of God, it should symbolize the future, the dawning of a new age, a coming kingdom of God, and our spectacular birth into the very family of God. Godspeed that day.